Hey, generous kid. Generous kid in the house. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and do some setup really quick. All right. Um, cool. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. And um, we're gonna wait like three more minutes. Um, although I think there's probably not gonna be that many of us today. Um, like I was saying last time, I think um, it's pretty interesting. The, the farther that we get into the course, usually the less people we have. Oh, it looks like Crypto Chica um, is providing Spanish translations. This is amazing. Gonna merge both of these in. Structures, man. So cool. So now I think chapter two. Yeah. Look at that. Oh, and chapter one point five, that's so awesome. Wow. All right. So how's everyone doing today? Shiver, what are you up to this Friday? See you with you, Fosca, generous kid, courtside. Are you doing anything fun today? Ola Banji, what's up, what's up? Sleep, yeah. Yeah, Shiver, I uh, I went to bed at like 4 in the morning last night, I think. Because I've like turned completely nocturnal at this point. Um, and I woke up at like 8. I'm just so tired. So we might all be half asleep together, but it's all right. Doing fine. It's good to hear, Vasque. Vasque, how are things going at the uh, Hyperverse? <laughs> Cortez said, pretend so funny. Pretending to look at Drunky Dan at my internship. That's hysterical. I've been there before. <laughs> Not much in Hyperverse, yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm uh no longer involved there, Fosque. I don't know if you'd notice that yet, but That's so funny though, courtside. <laughs> I mean we can all relate to that on some level. Do you uh I mean you don't have to answer if you don't want, but are are you like enjoying it like at all? Like are you enjoying the um like the uh like I guess like even just the job itself, like is it something that you could see yourself doing in the future? No? Oh wow. Wow. Was it something that you, you thought you would have enjoyed a couple months ago when you started it? Like is this like a new understanding? Or did you always know you were gonna hate it? Boring type yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it. Yeah, you know, it's a weird thing um, for students in... Um, it's a really weird thing for students in university because... Yeah, you know, I, I mean, I'm not going to lie. I never was really into data. It never really interested me. But, um, you know, it's a weird thing that universities do to you because um, they basically, like... I mean, it's not really universities, but it's more like just like the, the job force, like sort of forces you to get an internship in order to get experience. But, there, you know, there, have you ever seen that meme that's like, uh, you know, someone goes to get a job and they're like, you need experience. And then someone goes to like get experience and they go, you need a job. It's like a weird cycle of like endlessness. But um, it's like, yeah. And then they like force you to work some internship that like you're going to hate anyway. And like all it does is sort of like disinterest you from whatever you were going to do and like had any motivation to do. So I don't know. It's a weird life, but I, I feel you. But I um. Yeah. All right. Um, not much going. What's happened? Oh, I, to be honest, Fosca, I'm not sure. I uh, I stopped working there a couple, like a, probably a couple months ago. Um, so I honestly have no idea. Not moving us back then, Jacob. Yeah, maybe I was the uh, the legendary force. 
No, I'm just kidding. It's a good team. I just uh, I haven't uh, checked in, in a while. All right. So um, yeah. So welcome back, everybody. This is the uh, the second half of um, uh, what is it? Chapter four at this point. So we're on chapter four, day three, and chapter four, day four. So I think this is what the third to last workshop. So we're almost there, everybody. And if you're tuning in, thanks for doing so. And I hope this is uh, helping you in your Canaan's knowledge. Um, so yeah, let's uh, let's do it. So um, today's actually going to be a pretty easy day. I'm not going to lie. Um, and that's because we're not learning anything new. Um, we're simply tying all of our knowledge together um, to start making our own NFT contract. So uh, don't worry if you're you know getting overwhelmed on the knowledge side. Uh, you know it's it's you're not learning anything new today. We're simply reviewing everything. And uh, yeah, so what's pretty cool is that we're pretty much going to be making our own, um, you know, we're going to be making our own NFT contract from the ground up. So uh, you're going to basically see how NFT contracts are made. Um, so yeah, let's do it. So Fosca is hoping to get more grads from the bootcamp from here. Yeah, I think um, because we've basically been, uh, we've basically been running these bootcamps every single month since April. What is this? April, May, June, July. Yeah, this is the fourth one we've done in a row. So this is definitely the least amount of graduates we've had. But I think it's because like we already cover a lot of people. Um, I also think that it's it's funny because when you're in a bear market, like developers get scared. But it's usually the best time to build. So um, I wish we I wish we did have more people just for the sake of, um, you know, like teaching. I mean, it's. It's like a weird paradox because for instructors, it's actually a lot easier. So it's like better to have less. But of course, we would love to see more. Um, you know, we'd, we'd be much happier with more. But um, yeah, so I mean, I guess that is to say that, um, yeah, exactly, courtside. Like, I think I think if you're going to learn, I think now's the best time to do it. So I, I applaud that. Um, all right. So let's make our own NFT contract. Now, the first thing we always do uh, with these boot camps um, is, you know, what do we want to call our NFT contract? So, just, uh, I mean, I guess because it's just us here, um, you know, what do you guys want to call our NFT contract? Because we're going to be working on this the next couple of days. You can come up with whatever you want. In the first boot camp, we called it young, you know, we called it baby Jacob. In the next boot camp, I think Kim from the flow team came in. And made us call it. What did she have us call it? I can't remember. Wait, I kind of want to look it up now. Hold on, we have to find this. Where was it? Um, it was Emerald Academy. Oh wait, I might have to go to my the live uh, the past live streams. I I'm actually really curious what we called it. I think it was it was yeah it was May. Um, May workshop number eight. Okay, so what do we call it? We called it uh. You gonna load? Oh, busy bees. I don't know. I don't know why we called it, but Kim wanted to call it busy bees. And then during um, what was it? During June, we called it young Jacob instead of baby Jacob. So, anyways, uh, anyone have any ideas what we want to call our NFT contract? It's up to you. I can't choose. Anything you want. <laughs> no one wants to call it anything. Let's see if Fosca's got an idea. Moon, all right, cool. So that, I mean, I guess we're gonna go with that. So we're calling it Moon Jacob. All right. So that's our NFT contract for this uh, for this boot camp. Great job. All right. So Moon Jacob. All right. So now let's uh, let's just start making the contract. So um, you know, what is uh, what does everyone think is the most important thing in an NFT contract? What's the what's the first thing we should make? And what, what you know, what's like the sole purpose of this contract? Anyone have any ideas? Just based on what you know about, you know, you know, all the, I can't say it's going to give it away, but what's the, what's the first thing we should make in our NFT contract? Yeah, resource, right? Um, and, you know, more specifically, it's an NFT resource, right? So the first thing we're going to do is, you know, we've learned a lot about resources and we've learned that they actually represent NFTs really well, right? Um, they're assets that can't be overwritten. They, you know, they can only be destroyed if you want to destroy them. Um, and they're going to be able to, you know, be stored in our account storage. So, um, you know, it's really great to represent resources and as NFTs. And in fact, Cadence was designed around um, NFTs being resources as well, um, as we learned back in chapter one. So, 
let's go ahead and do that. Let's give it an ID just to give it an ID. Um, and let's also just give it a name just because we want to give it a name. Okay. And so we're going to add an initializer here. All of this, you now know, uh, which is pretty cool how far you've come. And I'm going to set the ID equal to the UUID as we talked about in the last uh, workshop. And I'm going to set the name or sorry, the, yeah, the, the name equal to a name that we pass in here. Um, I like to preface my init variables with underscore. You don't have to do that. It doesn't actually mean anything. I just like to distinguish between them. So uh, that's what there's going to be uh, so far, right? So pretty cool um, and also pretty simple. So boom, there's an NFT resource. And let's just add a function just for testing purposes to create an, or let's just call it mint NFT. Um, and this is going to return an NFT resource um, just like this. Now, obviously, this isn't the best case scenario because the, well, the problem is that anyone can mint an NFT, right, based on this. Um, and we don't want that. But we'll figure that out uh, later when we actually need to, to do that. So we don't have to worry about it right now because we're just testing. Um, and so, boom, that's our NFT resource right there. Now, one of the things that we actually talked about um, during the last uh, workshop was that, you know, there's an issue with owning multiple NFTs where we don't want to store them at one resource path, right? So, you know, if we make this signer, for example, and let's just refresh the page so we get uh, these little under, you know, so it actually knows what's going on. Oh, it's uh, supposed to be Moon Jacob, that's why. Um, <laughs> so we're going to call this signer. And remember that, you know, in order to mint an NFT, we would call, you know, uh, Moon Jacob dot mint NFT, right? We could pass in a name. Let's just call it uh, Fosque because Fosque came up with the name. And then in order to save it to storage, we would do signer dot save. We would move in the NFT and we would save it to slash storage slash, I don't know, my NFT, right? But does anyone remember what's the problem with just storing NFTs at one path here? Like what's going to happen when we try to um, store this at like another path? Um, well, what's going to happen is we would have to store it at like my NFT 2 and my NFT 3. And that's, that's super annoying, right? Um, we definitely don't want to be doing that. Um, and most of the reason for that is because, well, one, it's disorganized, and two, it's because when, you know, people like dApps go to read our collections, they're not going to know where we stored it, right? They're, they're going to have no idea. Um, and also, it's just not good practice to have to, um, you know, like, dynamically change storage paths. It's just a terrible idea. Um, and yeah, and also, yeah, so, so what Foskett is saying... So because resources actually can't be overwritten, it won't override it. It'll just panic and won't work if we do it here. Um, it won't over. It, it just like won't work. Um, but yeah, like we definitely don't want to start the same path. So a solution to this um, that we were talking about in the last workshop is actually to create a collection, right? So we have like a Moon Jacob collection right here. And what we would do is, is instead of storing the NFT here, we would store like a collection or something, right? So obviously we don't have this right now, but we would store a collection. And then we would deposit all of our NFTs into the collection, right? That, that way everything lives at one storage path. So it's almost like a wrapper, okay? So let's make a resource called collection, right? And this is going to be the, the main part of our contract. This is like the hefty sort of chunk. Um, and in here... We're going to make something called owned NFTs. And this is going to be a uh, resource mapping from a UN64 to an NFT like that. Okay. So pretty simple, right? We're just going to map the ID of the NFT. So uh, map the ID of the NFT to the NFT resource itself. All right. And then inside here, we're going to have a function to deposit, right? Because that probably makes sense. We probably want to deposit. And let's also make a function to withdraw because we also probably want to withdraw at some point. So let's go ahead and do that. And then we can make an init function that inside here just says self.owned NFTs and we move in an empty dictionary, right? So uh, that way it's solved. Now, this is something we actually haven't talked about yet, um, but it's a uh, something called a destroy function. So when you have a resource inside of another resource, we call that nested resources. When you have that in Cadence, um, you need to have something called a destroy function. So inside the destroy function, we need to specify self uh, or destroy self.owned NFTs. 
and the error goes away. Now, what this means is usually when you destroy a resource, you call destroy, right? And so it knows to call the implicit destroy function in the resource. In fact, every single resource has a destroy function automatically. You just can't see it. Um, but if you want to, you can add a destroy function and then do something in here when the resource is destroyed. So, for example, if I wanted to, like, you know, um, I don't know, uh, you know, incre uh, I don't know, like change some variable right inside here, I could do that um, when this uh, resource is destroyed. So if you want to, you can always make a destroy function to do that. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, float, for example, has like utilizes destroy functions a lot. But anyways, the main point is that when you have a destroy function here, um, you know, uh, you need to put um, destroy self to owned NFTs when you have nested resources so that it, it knows that when you destroy collection, you also just destroy all the resources inside of it. Okay, which is what's happening right here. So that's it. Now, um, what we're going to do is we're going to implement deposit and withdraw. And then we're going to play around with this collection and see uh, what happens. So the cool part is that, um, you know, we've already learned or I've already taught you how to, uh, you know, deposit and withdraw from resource dictionaries. That I think that was in chapter three. So you already know how to do this, um, which is pretty cool. So let's just go ahead and review that. So, you know, ideally we would pass in like a token here. Um, and this is an NFT resource, right, itself. And what we would do is we would say self.owned NFTs um, at token.id. And we're going to force move in. Remember the force move operator? Force move in the token. So there it is. It's just one line. Um, all this says is we take in the NFT right right here, and we're going to force move it in, which means if something already exists at token.id, panic and abort the program. Otherwise, put it in there, and uh, it'll now live at token.id. So pretty simple. And for withdraw, it's going to be just two simple lines. We're going to say let NFT be uh, self.ownedNFTs.remove, and the key is going to be a withdraw ID. So the ID of the NFT we want to remove, right? And that's going to go right here. And then we're going to return uh, NFT just like this and specify that the return value is an NFT type. Now, the only other difference is um, you'll see it says, uh, well, if we scroll down, it says mismatch types, expected moonjacob.nft got a moonjacob.nft optional. So we could technically fix it by doing this, but it's probably better to uh, panic on this line. So if the NFT doesn't exist in the collection and it goes to withdraw an ID that doesn't exist, we say panic, this NFT does not exist in this collection. Okay, and then all the errors go away. So pretty self-explanatory. Uh, self and what we can also do um, is we can add one more function called get IDs. And this is gonna be a very simple function that returns an array of UN64s. And all this is going to do is return self.ownedNFTs.keys. Okay? So it's just going to return all the IDs of the NFTs that we have in our collection. That way we can do some testing and, and stuff like that. So let's go ahead and deploy this contract. All right. And let's go to a transaction. And let's start playing around with this. So let's make a collection variable that says, uh-oh, I already forgot something. So how the heck are we going to make a collection? Well, we need a function for that, right? So let's go ahead down here and make a function called create empty collection. And it's going to return a collection resource. Oops. And in here it's going to say return um, return uh, create collection. And it, there's no init parameter, so it's pretty simple. All right. So there we go. Um, and uh, we have our empty collection function right there. So let's go ahead and redeploy this one. Uh-oh. Playground is being stupid again. Uh, deploy and boom now we're fine uh what's up snowmobiles snowmobiles i noticed you uh you changed your your profile picture i got so used to the uh the dog <laughs> all right so inside the transaction let's go ahead and you know we already made this collection now instead of minting the nft we're gonna say moon jacob dot uh, um create empty collection empty collection just like that Right? Why does it say I it says refresh the page? Okay. So maybe Okay, cool. So we create an empty collection and then we're gonna save the collection to slash storage slash moon Jacob collection. Alright? And then down here we're just gonna log um you know 
we made a new collection. Awesome. So in here, we're just going to call it setup, right? Because in order to do anything, we need to have a collection in our account. So we're going to go ahead and set up. So let's send this. And boom, we made a new collection, right? So now account one has a collection in their account. So woohoo, uh, that's pretty easy. So let's go ahead and make another transaction. And we're going to call this um, mint NFT. All right. So this transaction is going to be how we mint NFTs. So let's copy this transaction. Go into here. And by the way, after this, I'll pause for any questions. Um, let's go ahead and mint an NFT. So what we're going to want to do is inside of here, we're going to say a uh, let collection equals signer dot borrow. Okay. The type is going to be a reference to a moon Jacob dot collection. And it's going to be from slash storage slash moon Jacob collection. And if it doesn't exist, then we'll just panic and say, you know what? Um, this account does not have a collection in their storage. All right. Then after we do that, we're just going to say collection dot deposit, and we're going to move in a moon Jacob dot create um, or mint NFT. And uh, we'll just call this Fosca. Right, so does this make sense? I, I could have done this on two lines. I could have first minted the NFT and then moved it in here, but I decided to just do collection at deposit uh, token and then move in the NFT right here. So does anyone have any guesses? What's going to happen if I run this from account five right now? Anyone know? What's going to happen if I try and run this from account five? Just to make sure that we we sort of understand what the issues may be. Yeah, so it's it, it's more like um I yeah of course I th I think you understand it it's it's that you know account five doesn't have a collection set up in their account um. So it's it technically you know they can mint because anyone can mint right now. Um, it's just that they wouldn't be able to store it in their account because they don't have a collection which set up, which is I think what you meant. Um, so exactly, and I I hope that this sort of provides like some insight into you know this is why you have to set up your collections. Um, oh no worries, MPI. Thanks for joining in. Um, MPI, would it be helpful because I, there's 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 so little of us here. Would it be helpful, MPI, if I sort of like did like a quick recap for you or? or... Oh, <laughs> yeah, no worries, Courtside. Keep rolling. All right, cool. Um, be because we actually have a, a, a like two or three people that are new in here, I'm, I'm going to very quickly recap like 20 seconds. All we've done so far is we made an NFT resource with an ID and a name field. So you know that pretty simple. Then we made a collection resource. The collection resource has a owned NFTs dictionary that stores NFTs inside of them. And all we did so far is make a deposit, withdraw, and get IDs function. Deposit obviously deposits an NFT. Uh, this withdraws an NFT. And this gets a list of all the IDs in the collection, right? And so we made a setup transaction to store the collection in our account. And now we're just minting NFTs into the collection. So that's all we've done so far. Um, so yeah, and, and the question I just asked was, well... Um, you know, if I ran the setup from account one, right? So for example, I already ran this from account one. And if I try to run it again, it's not going to work because it already stores the collection there, right? But if I only ran this from account one and we tried to mint an NFT, we were asking, is this going to work? And the answer is no, it's not going to work because, um, you know, account five, for example, doesn't have a moon Jacob that collection in their storage. Um, so it would panic on this line and let's actually try it. Um, boom, this account does not have a collection in their storage, so it doesn't work. Um, but of course, we set up account one, so it'll work totally fine. Um, and in here, we can actually log, um, uh, you know, we just minted an NFT. All right. And uh, let's try it out. So let's do it with account one. And boom, we just minted an NFT, right? So all is working and all is fine. Now let's confirm that. Let's go to a script. And let's somehow confirm that. But I actually made a mistake inside the setup. Uh, it's actually a good mistake just to show all of you. 
Um, there's no way in a script right now to read uh, get IDs, right? Does anyone know why there's no way to do that right now? Any guesses? Why is it that we can't in a script right now read get IDs? What did we forget to do in the setup in the setup step to be able to read it from us from a script? I'm missing one line right here that would allow me to do that. Yeah, linking exactly. So I have to do signer link. And I'm going to link it to a public path. Let's say Moon Jacob Collection. The slash public slash Moon Jacob Collection. And the target is obviously slash storage slash Moon Jacob Collection. Because that's where we that's where it's currently stored in storage right here. And the we have to specify the type. And for now, because we're just doing very, things very simply and we don't really care about security, we're going to do Moon Jacob dot uh, collection. All right. So obviously, in the real world, you would never, ever, ever want to do you know, this type, because this is exposing a Moon Jacob collection to the public, which means that technically right now anyone could just withdraw my NFTs, but we're just testing right now, so it's totally okay. All right, so let's go ahead. Let's actually run this from account. Let's let's run this from account two now, just to test. So from account two, let's set up. All right. And then from account two, let's mint an NFT. So send it. All right, boom. And let's go to a script. So now let's read uh, from like a user, which is an address. We're gonna call this Moon Jacob, and we're gonna get a public capability to our collection, and then read the IDs. So let's do that together. So let's say let uh, collection um, equals uh, get account of the user dot get capability, and this is all coming from the last workshop. In case you're confused, Jacob collection. I'm just doing it all in like one line. Dot borrow, and then in here I'm gonna put. Um, Moon Jacob dot collection, right? That's the type that we expose to the public path. And then I'm going to panic if this doesn't exist there, right? So this would only work for the accounts that we set up. So um, a properly linked collection does not exist here. All right. And then we're just going to add one more line that returns collection dot get IDs. And that's going to return a UN64 array. So if we read from account two, we should see that there is a, a one element in the array. Um, nope, we don't because the playground is not happy. But if we try again, boom, there we go. So it's a saying we returned an array, and the value is has one element in it. The type of it is a UN64, and the value is three. So it looked like um, it returned an array where uh, in our collection right now, we currently have an NFT with ID three inside our collection. So um, Ooh, we just, um, you know, we just uh, basically made a super simple NFT contract that, um, you know, does all these things, right? So pretty cool. Um, now, there's a few problems for sure. Um, yeah, there's a few problems uh, for sure with this. Um, one of them that we mentioned is this one, right? So obviously, withdraw right now is exposed to the public, and that's definitely not good. Um, let me make sure that this is all in day three. I want to see, uh, make sure I cover everything in here. Um, did I do everything in here? Uh, withdraw. Okay, so we have to make, okay, cool. So I'm missing two things. Um, one of the things I forgot to mention was uh, this is going to be important later, but let's make a total supply variable. That's a UN64. And all this is going to do is let's actually initialize it to zero so we get rid of this error supply equals zero. Um, and what we're going to do is every single time we mint an NFT, we're going to say supply equals supply plus one. So um, again, all we're going to say is every single time the NFT is minted, we're going to increment the total supply. Um, now, I want to I wanna do a quick uh, debrief really, uh, really fast on um, Flow's example NFT contract. I want to show you an example of what not to do. Um, and funny enough, it's what the flow team does, but I want to show you what not to do. So, um, so this is, uh, this, in, this long contract is the flow team's version of an FT contract. Um, you could probably learn a bit from this, but I want to show you what's actually, I don't like about this at all. So what they do is they, at the very top here, they have a total supply you'll see, right? That's a UN64. And again, there's a reason for this, but we're just not talking about it until next time. There's a total supply here, right? Now, what they do is they actually, down below, 
they have a resource called NFT Minter, and they have a function inside of that called Mint NFT. Now, this is basically a function where um, you know someone with the NFT Minter can call a Mint NFT function to mint, right? And they do the incrementing here. Now, this is obviously like okay, and it's going to work, um, but I'm not a fan of it because the issue with this is that what happens if you know this contract gets upgraded, right? And you know they do a minting somewhere else. Let's say they also mint uh, in some other part of the contract, and they forget to put this line. Well, it's not going to work properly. Whereas if you put it inside the init function of the NFT, right, it's always going to increment it whenever an NFT is created ever, right? So I am always a fan of putting things at the lowest possible level. Um, that way, you don't have to keep track of where you're incrementing things throughout time. So um, always make sure to, um, if you can, put things at the lowest possible level, or the what I mean by that is the closest to where the action's happening, um, so you don't have to like drive yourself nuts with making sure that your contract is secure and working properly. So with that being said, I would put the incrementing inside the init function um, to, to do that. And this is one of those very small, like nitpick, very nitpicky ideas, um, but it's it's something that I think if you're if you really want to be, you know, the best of the best, those are the little things to look out for. Okay, so cool. So let's go ahead and uh, go back to what else are we missing? Oh yeah. So we want to improve um, our, you know, um, we want to improve our contract so that it's not like completely not secure. Um, again, the issue right now is that inside our setup, right, we're linking an entire MoonJacob collection to the public. Um, Quartz says, why doesn't everyone just use the same logic in the standard functions? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by that, Quartz side. Uh, standard functions. You might have to explain, like NFT Minter. Um, everyone uses the same logic in all the standard functions, like this one. So, so my question is like, if uh, you have the standard contract, and then typically all of them have the uh, NFT Minter resource, um, why doesn't everyone just do the same logic if, if if they're all the same things rather than doing it in different ways? Oh, so you're, you're saying? Uh, I think you're so saying. Like, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if NFT Minter is in the standard or not. Hmm. Um, is 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 that in the standard? No, so so uh, okay. NFT Minter so is yeah. Okay, so then that kind of um, that's probably why it was it was confusing. I I, th I thought maybe that was one of the functions in the in interface in the standard interface that uh, had to be implemented. So I thought maybe if everyone like is implementing the same interface with those functions, then why not use the same logic? But but if that isn't in the standard, then then that makes sense. That's a great question. Yeah, I think. I think part of the reason that um, it's not in the standard is because the flow team wanted to allow people to to do their own minting, right? Because um, like, you know, an NFT contract shouldn't, or an NFT standard shouldn't really regulate how they're minted. You know, some people want open minting, some people want restricted minting, some people want admin minting, right? So everyone handles minting differently, um, which is why like a, something like NFT Minter is not in the standard right now. Um, but yeah, and I think that like, Every, you know, like I said, everyone sort of handles it differently. Uh, we're going to do a similar thing with NFT Minter. Um, it's just that, you know, things like these are like just little tiny details that I just change up in my contracts. Uh, I, I see. Thank you. Yeah, sure. All right. So, um, yeah, so we definitely don't want to link the whole collection to the public. Of course, we needed to right now because we needed to read get IDs um, in the script. But let's go ahead and make our own. Um, resource interface called collection public and inside collection public we're going to put a few things so to me i think it's totally fine to put deposit in here because who cares if someone gives us free nfts we're going to put in uh not withdraw i don't know why i highlighted that we definitely don't want to put that in there um <laughs> we're going to put in get ids and so far this should be okay and let's go ahead and implement this on our collection resource right so if we now redeploy our contract, um, let's, uh, I, okay, so this, I've noticed this, by the way, if you get that error and then you just click a space and allow it to recompile and click deploy, it usually is fine. 
So it, it's a little nicer actually nowadays after all my screaming and yelling. You're probably sick of me at this point. <laughs> um, but anyways, back to setup. We can now um, you know, restrict this linking to a moon Jacob dot collection public. Um, just like that. Well, I think that it's probably still a little behind. Yeah, okay. Wait, what? Oh. Okay, cool. So now uh, you know, people can only call deposit and get IDs on our um on our public link. So if we go ahead and run this from account one. Uh, let's add a space here. Nice. Um, let's go ahead and mint an NFT. Boom. And let's go ahead and do the script. Now we have to change this or else it's, it's going to panic because it's not the right type right now. Dot collection public. And let's go to account two. God. What? Oh, it's account one. I think I just set up account one. Yeah, okay, there we go. So we have a uh, NFT with uh, ID one inside our collection. So woohoo, we did it. Um, and I think if we scroll down a little more, is that everything I wanted to cover in here? Yeah, I think so. Cool, I think that's it. So that's everything we wanted to cover in this chapter. Um, any questions so far on this? Otherwise, I'm gonna go to chapter four, day four, and then we'll we'll wrap up this chapter. Any questions about any of that? Um, yeah. So next, we're gonna talk about um, restricting minting to a uh, admin per se, that only an admin can mint. And wait, what else are we doing? Part? Oh, borrowing. Okay. Okay. All right. Cool. Let's do it. So right now in our NFT contract, uh, we have a bit of a problem, and that's uh, the fact that anybody can mint. Um, we probably don't want that if we're selling our NFTs or something like that. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a resource called NFT Minter. You can call this whatever you want. You can call this admin. I don't know. I actually mostly call it admin, but I'm calling it NFT Minter because that's what they do in the example. So let's go ahead and uh, do that. And it's a pretty simple change, actually. So we just make it so that uh, only someone with the NFT Minter resource can call Mint NFT. So down here in the init function... Uh, oh, okay. So we haven't talked about this yet. So... A great way to implement um, like admin functionality is um, saving things to account storage in the init function of the contract. So what the heck do I mean by that? Well, you know, traditionally what we've seen so far is that in a transaction, you can save things to account storage like we do right here um, because we have access to the auth account, right? Um, now, the issue is that we obviously don't want to make a function called like you know, public function create NFT minter, because if anyone could call this, right, that would be really bad because then, well, anyone would, would be able to get an NFT minter and then anyone would be able to mint. So that makes no sense. The way to solve this is inside the init function of the contract, you can actually access the auth account of the contract. So I'll show you. Auth account is an auth account type equals uh, self.account. So it's actually pretty interesting. You'll see we just got the auth account of the contract by saying self.account. So what you can do is you can say self.account.save, move in a create NFT minter like that, and we'll store it to like slash stored slash uh, NFT minter, something like that. Now, um, it actually, because this is sort of bad practice, and the reason this is bad practice is because um, you never want to call your your storage pads like a standard name because likely it's already taken. So we want to store this like slash storage slash moon Jacob NFT minter. That way it's 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 like available in our in our storage. Of course on the emulator it doesn't matter, but in like the real world it's better practice to do this. So this is pretty cool because we've created an NFT minter and saved it to our account, right? And again, this is getting saved to account one because this is the, they're the person deploying the contract. But we don't expose uh, creating an NFT minter anywhere, so we're pretty we're pretty secure. 
So we can go ahead, redeploy this, all right? And boom, we redeployed it, all right? So back to our setup, let's also, I don't know, let's just set up account two. So account one is the admin and account two is the user. Let's set up account two, all right? And then let's go to Mint NFT. So inside of Mint NFT, um, you know, we know th this is no longer good, right? And so if we actually refresh this page, you're going to notice that we get an error here now because this doesn't exist anymore. Moon Jacob that Mint NFT doesn't exist. So the way to fix this is, well, the signer in this case, right? The signer has to be someone with an NFT Minter resource. Otherwise, you can't mint, right? Because you're not going to be able to get the Minter from their storage. So let's say... Let's let's put this all down here for now. Let's say let minter equals signer dot borrow. Oh, oops, dot borrow from slash storage slash uh, moon Jacob NFT minter. And the type in here is going to be a moon Jacob dot NFT minter. Okay. And we're going to panic if this doesn't exist and say, um, you know, hey, the NFT, uh, the signer does not, or the signer is not a minter. Okay. Now that we have the minter, right, because they're the person signing the transaction, we can go ahead and mint an NFT to a user's account. But the thing is that, you know, in this case, this is just borrowing it from the signer, but we're not minting to ourselves. You know, the minter is supposed to be minting to someone else. So what we actually have to do here is we have to get someone's public um, want to collection. Cook my stuff so i came out here and i tried to cook it it didn't okay i think it was just a open mic so we have to get the public collection now the cool thing is we don't have to retype this all out because we already actually got this logic in the script so we actually already know how to how to get someone's public collection so um the only thing we're missing is like a user variable so let's go ahead and uh pass in a user that we want to mint to so in this case user is the recipient of the mint but the signer is the person minting. All right. So now we have the public collection of the user. And so we can say collection dot deposit, right? And then in here, or let's actually do this on two lines. Let's say let NFT be minter dot mint NFT. And we're going to call this again Fosca. And then we're going to move the NFT in, into the account here. Now, the cool thing is. In it, because deposit, right, this deposit function is inside the collection public interface, we can we can do this without having the recipient be the signer because we don't have to access their account storage. We can just get the public link to their collection. So this is almost like an airdrop in a way. It's like the the, the signer who's the minter is like airdropping uh, NFT to a user. So does this make sense to everybody? Um, and actually, just to make things more proper, we should probably not just make this one name. We should pass this in as an argument. So this should be a string. Uh, the only reason I've been hard coding arguments, by the way, is because the playground's a lot more buggy with arguments. But it's for 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 proper sake, we're supposed to be passing these in as arguments. Okay, so the user is account two because that's who we set it up with. The name is let's just call it Fosque. Now, who should be the signer in this case? Who's, which account should be the signer here? Any ideas? Yeah, exactly. It's account one. Um, and it's account one because that is the person that, you know, deployed the contract. And so because they deployed the contract, they also were saved a minter right here. So they, they are the minter in this case. So account one is the minter. So let's do that together. And uh, the user is going to be account two because they're the person we set up the collection for. The name is going to be Fosque. And the minter is going to be one. Now, actually, let's try two and see what happens. So it doesn't work, right? Because, hey, the signer is not a minter. Same thing with three. Right? And same thing with four. Same thing with five. None of these accounts have the minter in them. Um, but if we try from account one, let's clear this again. Um, all of a sudden, boom, it works. So account one has the minter, right? Which has got it right here. Um, we airdropped it to the recipient. 
and then we uh, do uh, these two right here. We mint the NFT and then deposit it to the collection. And we can check that in the script. We can actually, let's just call this like read uh, IDs. And if we run this from account two, we should get uh, an NFT inside of here. So perfect, it's in there. All right, so that is uh, minting. Now, one other thing we want to do is right now, um, you know, we, we, we're obviously reading the IDs of the NFTs in our collection, but we're not like reading more metadata about them, right? We're not reading the actual metadata of the NFTs, um, which in this case, they have an ID and a name, right? So uh, how do we read those things? Well, right now, we would have to, in a transaction, withdraw it, right? Read the NFTs metadata and then deposit it back. Um, now, there's two problems with this. One, that's super inconvenient and annoying. And two, we can only withdraw in a transaction. So, um, you know, in a script, we wouldn't be even be able to read NFT metadata because to do it, we'd, we would have to withdraw, but you can't do that in a script because you don't have the auth account. So, uh, well, I mean, technically you do actually nowadays, but remember we talked about the, the weird auth account function nowadays. So it, it's kind of weird teaching this now, actually, because... Technically, you can, but it's anyways. Main point is it's it's really stupid to have to withdraw an NFT just to deposit it back to read its metadata. So, any ideas on on what function we could add here in order to read the NFT metadata without having to withdraw and deposit? What's like the a topic we covered that would help us do this? We could get something to the resource. Yeah, exactly. A, a reference. So what we can do is we can get a reference to the resource, right? That way it can stay in here, but we can read its metadata totally fine. So let's do a public function borrow NFT. And we're going to return a reference here to an NFT. And what we're going to do is say, okay, we're going to take in an ID and it's going to be a UN64. And let's, let's go ahead and return something. So this gets really uh, actually interesting. And uh, if Ngayo was here, uh, I know Ngayo would definitely hate this. Um, but I, I don't know actually where he is nowadays. I think he stopped coming to the workshops. It's kind of sad. But um, I, I say that because there's a lot of logic that goes into this. And it's like weird. But any, or not logic, but like syntax. So let's figure this out. So we need a reference to an NFT. So we can say, okay, we're going to return a reference to self.owned NFTs at the specific ID. And remember, with all references, we have to for we have to we have to cast. So we have to say as a reference to an NFT. Now, remember that that dictionaries return optional types, so it's actually an optional reference, right? But because it's an optional reference, and we just want to return a normal reference, we have to wrap the whole thing and force cast it out. Or we could panic here, right? Whatever you want. But anyways, we have to we have to do this. All right, so it's, it's, it's actually a weird little line, but it's pretty cool. Um, and this will allow us to get the, uh, you know, get, get the thing here. So what we can do is, um, well, you know, what we'd have to do right now, actually, is we have to take this borrow NFT function and put it in collection public, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to read it in the script. And it looks like our playground is completely bugging out. So let's refresh the page. and paste it back. So are there two optionals in this line? No, there's only one. So the reason I'll go back again. So uh, this is what it looks like normally. But um, you know, when you return, when you access something in a dictionary, it always returns an optional. So this is actually an optional reference. Um, because you're getting a reference to an optional type because this is uh, optional. But we just unwrap the whole thing. So it's actually just one optional. And we're just unwrapping it here. Now, for some reason, uh, the playground is not liking this at all. And uh, I'm not really sure how to move on without this working. So maybe we'll try uh, count two. I don't know. Truly bizarre. It's like completely crashed. All right, so I guess we'll have to migrate over to a new playground. Yay! Thanks, Flo! I'll try this again.
I'll try to manually type it out instead of copy pasting it. All right, thank God. I think it's, I think it might work. All right, thank the Lord. Someone thank the Lord. All right, perfect. So uh, it worked. All right, cool. So it's in there now. Uh, you know, all this is the same. This is called. This is setting up. Right. Let's set it up uh, with account two. Boom. Let's uh, mint an NFT to account two. Sign it with one. Send it. Boom. Mint an NFT. And if we go to read our IDs, account two, we should get uh, that an ID with uh, two exists in the collection. So let's make another script and call this read metadata, right? And inside here, we're going to make a public function main that takes in a user, which is an address, and an ID of the NFT, which is a UN64. And we're going to return a uh, reference to a moonjacob.nft. Uh, uh, Quartzite, I think you actually asked about this the other day about returning like uh, whole metadata from scripts. So this is uh, how you would do that. Um, all right, so then inside here, uh, we need to, first of all, we need to get the public collection. So we know how to do that. We're just going to copy and paste this code. All right. So let's first get the collection. And then let's return collection .borrow NFT and pass in the ID. And that's about it. So let's go ahead and type in a user. Uh, let's two. And what's the ID? Well, we just did uh, get read IDs. And it's told us that we have an NFT, which is right here, that has an ID of two. So let's go ahead and put two here uh, and execute. And boom, there we go. We got a whole uh, reference to the, to the uh, resource. So it says it's a uh, NFT. The fields are, it has a uh, UUID with uh, two. It has an ID with two. Um, and it has a name of Fosque. So boom, we just read the metadata of our NFT, totally fine. And there it is. Pretty cool. So there's all our metadata. All right, now what else did I want to cover? Uh, oh, transferring? Sure, so uh, we'll do one more uh, transaction and this is going to be called transfer NFT. Now this isn't going to include any logic inside the transaction or inside the contract. It's uh, just simply stuff that we're going to do in, in the transaction. So this is going to show you uh, how to transfer an NFT. So um, we have a, uh, a user. Let's call this the recipient. And uh, we're going to pass in an ID of the NFT to transfer between two accounts. So the signer is the person giving away the NFT. And the recipient is the person receiving the NFT and the ID is the ID of the NFT we are transferring. All right. So what we can do is we can borrow um, the signer collection like this. They signer.borrow moonjacob.collection from slash storage slash moonjacob collection. Say, hey, uh, the signer does not have a collection set up. Then we're going to get the, re the recipient collection equals get account uh, recipient, uh, get, a, get a public capability to their collection, right? And then we're just going to say recipient collection dot deposit. And the token we're going to deposit to their collection is signer collection dot withdraw. And then the withdraw ID, which is just ID. So in this line, we're withdrawing an NFT with the ID from the signer's collection and depositing it to the recipient's collection. So let's go back. Let's set up like account three for the, this this purpose. Set up account three. And if you go to read IDs, we should see that account two right now has an NFT inside of it, right? It has an NFT inside of it right here. But if we go to transfer, oh. We just transferred. All right. Let's transfer. So the recipient is account three, ID of two, and the uh, signer is account two. They're the person with the NFT. So if we run this, send it, we just transferred an NFT. And if you go back, account two no longer has anything in their collection, right? It's empty, but account three now has the NFT. So we successfully transferred the NFT. 
So that is the base logic of an NFT smart contract. Um, next week, we're going to talk about how to make it like an official NFT contract. And that's going to be it. Yep. So, um, oh, so one more thing, by the way. And uh, again, this isn't necessary. But if we go back to uh, actually execute, let me look up ex uh, in here. I think it's in chapter two. Execute phase. No, it's not in there, I guess. Here, maybe? Um, okay, so I'm going to go back to chapter two for a second. So in chapter two, day two, there's a note here. It says, you can, uh, you can see this being done in the prepare portion, whatever. The whole point of the prepare phase is to access the information data in your account. And obviously now we realize that because we have access to the auth account, right? But it's just on the, on the other hand, the execute phase can't do that, but it can call functions and do stuff to change the data on the blockchain. Note, in reality, you never actually need the execute phase. You can technically do everything in the prepare phase, but the code is less clear that way. It's better to separate the logic. What I mean by that, now that, we're, now that we know what both these do, is look what we're doing here. In this case, we're doing all the logic in this portion of the, the transaction, and it works, it's completely fine, and it's gonna work the same way as if we did stuff in the execute phase. But I'm gonna show you, and again, this is one of those things where it's like, it's only really cool if you wanna be like a really good Cadence developer, but I'm gonna show you the proper way to separate the logic of this transaction. And I don't actually teach this in the course, so it's kind of new information. But the better way to do this is right under transaction, you can specify certain variables here. So let, and I, I always, you always capitalize them. So you, you capitalize them and it makes them green like this. And you put the type of what they are. So moonjacob.collection. And the next one is let um, recipient collection uh, is a uh, moon. Uh, it's actually this whole type right here. It's a public moon Jacob collection. Right. And then what you do is, is right here, you say self.signer collection equals that. And here, say self.recipient collection equals this. Okay. And you don't put this line here. What you do is, you put this line in the execute phase. And you say self.recipient collection and then self.signer collection. So you'll notice that this is much more like properly organized in the sense that. The whole point of the prepare phase is to access accounts and set up information. So we know that we can access the you know signer's collection here, and we can also access this the recipient's collection here. So in the prepare phase, it's all for setup, whereas the execute phase is actually for like making things happen. Um, and we can do that right here. So we can access recipient collection by doing self dot self dot signer, all that fun jazz. So um, again, this isn't important if you just care about functionality. But if you care about being, you know, the extra step in cadence development and being, you know, the extra level of perfection, this is what you should be uh, expecting to see. So, um, yeah, just thought I would show that to all of you in case you're curious um, about that sort of stuff. And I hope that's helpful. All right. Um, and, you know, we can also apply this sort of organizational skills to here as well. But, um, you know, maybe as a challenge, you could sort of on your own, try that out and see if you can better organize this. Um, the main idea would be to keep these two in the prepare phase, but to keep put these two in the execute phase. So I'm going to go ahead and save this playground so that we can use it next time. All right. Um, and yeah, that's all I have for you today. So thanks everybody for coming. Um, and uh, I'll see you next Wednesday. So have an awesome weekend. I feel like the weeks are flying by at this point. I don't even know what's happening. Um, but have an awesome weekend. Have a great Friday. And uh, I'll see you next Wednesday. Oh, oh, float. Sorry. There you go. All right, so the, the password is um, chapter four. All lowercase, all one word. Chapter four, because we just finished chapter four. And uh, once you've claimed that, you're all good to go. That's the... Uh, exit ticket it kind of feels like when you're like in elementary school and your teacher says like oh like in order to like leave the classroom you have to like solve this math problem <laughs> in this case it's a float so it's kind of better
actually it's a lot better than that traumatizing portion of your life. Um, all right. Yep, that's actually all I have for you today. Um, no double floaties for last set. <laughs> well, in 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 the honor of them being participation NFTs, um, I can't make a double float. I, I guess I could technically. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> but in the sake of uh, participation, it would. Fe it, I can't give out a one today for the other time. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm just kidding. Um. All right, cool. All right, peace out, everyone. See you on on Wednesday. Bye bye. Have an awesome.